Hi, everybody. Recording in progress. It's called The Voice of God. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, it's really a pleasure today to introduce Dan and Kate coming uh, to visit us from Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Dan did his PhD in Dan Faisal did his PhD in industrial and systems engineering at Georgia Tech and then a postdoc at Livermore. And he spent most of his career at Livermore. And now he's a program lead for predictive design of biologics, which is what they'll talk about today. And Kate Arundel? Errol. Errol. It's uh, so much simpler than Errol. As <laughs> well, as as a, the <laughs> got it. Has her PhD in, um, from UNC Chapel Hill in virology. I don't know if your PhD is in virology, but in virology related things, mm -hmm. virology. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then um, did a postdoc at NIH and then GSK. And now she's a, a PI, principal investigator at Lawrence Livermore, working on the biological side and biomedical science at Lawrence Livermore. And so today they're going to talk about um, generative molecular design for antibodies and maybe other biologics. Okay, great. Thank Turn it over much. to you guys. Thank you so much for coming. So um, yeah, thanks Thanks for having us. This is exciting. We've already had a couple discussions this morning uh, and I'm, I'm blown away with the cool work going on here and how much overlap there is with what we're doing. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about potentially identifying some collaborations here. I think there's there's tons of opportunities there. Um, we, Kate and I both lead this program at Lawrence Livermore on predictive design of biologics. We call it the guide program. It's generative unconstrained intelligent drug engineering. Um, and so it's a large program. Um, it's a six year funded effort. Um, it involves um, about 80 of us at the at Lawrence Livermore, and you know almost as many collaborators um, um, from uh, academia, um, uh, biotech, pharma, and other other national labs. Um, so we're always looking for more partners. Um, we're doing lots of exciting work, which we'll talk about here. So we'll give you kind of a quick little history of what we've done in the last couple of years, and a little bit about where we're going next. So um, I'll let Kate start. Yeah. And Please feel free to interrupt. We're going to interrupt each other as the talk goes on anyway, so um, keep it casual. Oh, man. I wasn't prepared for the animations. Okay, so I think, you know, uh, some topics circulating in infectious diseases for a long time have percolated more to worldwide attention lately. So, you know, I, there have been smaller and more recurrent scares with influenza, maybe a scarier scare with Ebola, um, and now we've come to worldwide attention um, with SARS-1 and SARS-2, um, and that we are not responding quickly enough to any of these threats to be truly effective, unless we started 10 years prior, which was the case for the SARS-2 vaccine, actually. Um, and so this is, this is going to be a multi-component approach, right? If you take any one of these things, if you have earlier um, detection of a new emerging threat, um, earlier, better, more widespread diagnostics, all of those will sort of shift this graph to the left and reduce the total impact um, on health and human disease, um, but also, you know, making development more rapid, making manufacturing more rapid and, and potentially doing things preemptively is really what it's gonna take um, to shift us from being sort of um, variant chasers, which I think we've all been at some point during this pandemic, um, to, to truly getting ahead of things and being effective. Um, and so in, in antibodies discovery specifically, uh, the traditional process, sort of the cutting edge process is to find someone who has survived whatever horrible thing has just come up next um, wait for them to recover, wait for their antibodies to mature. This usually takes several months to get sort of those high quality, um, highly potent antibodies that you would actually want to manufacture at scale. Um, and then you need to get them to volunteer uh, their serum um, or potentially more invasive uh, collection procedures. Um, and then you're going to sort, uh, sort these cells, these B cells um, in high throughput and try to ant identify antibodies um, through a, a large funnel of, you know, going from tens of thousands of potential candidates, whittling it down to one or two or three that you might take into um, preclinical and clinical studies. Um, so there are, this, is, this has been a great approach. It's been very fast. It's been very effective. Um, like any approach, it has some gaps. So it does require that convalescent serum. So many of you might remember how early in the pandemic, people were dying. Um, China had samples, but they were not sharing because um, we weren't very friendly with them at the time. Um, and so, you know, this, this sort of is a, is a bottleneck and sort of getting to that first stage. Um, and also, um, if, you're, if you're isolating them sort of at the, at the back end, um, you're subject to whatever the body has made. They may not be potent enough. Um, they may only be very specific for one variant. They may not be cross-protective. Um, so you're just sort of, um, you've got what, what you've got. 
And so the idea is that um, maybe we can use prototype pathogens and get ahead of this curve. So for the example of SARS-1 and SARS-2, we had antibodies against SARS-1. Um, they didn't work against SARS-2, but we already had information about how we might protect against that highly similar pathogen. So what epitopes are protective. Um, and so if we can use in silico design to get ahead of that, rather than waiting for the convalescent serum, that provides a complementary approach. Um, it, it still depends on, on convalescent serum. So it's not like these are replacements, but they're more complementary. And this way you could, you could pre-position, you could alter something rapidly. Um, so this is, this is just that example. So we started um, late in, no, early in 2020, um, as before I was at the lab, <laughs> we, we in the royal sense. Um, so we started with these neutralizing antibodies to CoV-1 um, that didn't bind SARS-CoV-2, didn't protect, didn't neutralize like, like they did for SARS-1, um, but, but they were awful close. Um, and then so we used a, a couple rounds of in silico redesign, experimental testing, recalibrating that system back into in silico design, and then back into experimentation to identify, oh, this is um, going through sort of the, the breadth of that. So in this search space, there were 10 to the 40 possible antibody mutants. So obviously we're not doing that exhaustive search, um, but you, know, you can see how many CPU and GPU hours they spent um, to do 5 million of those, so a very small subset. Um, and then whittle that down to only 100 antibody mutants, which was all we could test in high throughput at that time. We're building that up as well. Um, and then so you end up with these, these modestly mutated um, antibodies that can actually potently bind, neutralize, and protect against SARS-2. Uh, so the first one is, I think it's an actual crystal structure. It's a, it's a co-complex between um, SARS-CoV-1 and one of the antibodies. Um, and then the, the oh, actually, is that, is that cheating? Um, and then the second one is a, a model. It's just highlighting the, the differences. So there was, a, there was a structure of SARS-1 and the SARS-1 antibody. Mm -hmm. We had to model the SARS-1 antibody in complex with SARS-2. And then what's shown on the right is the mutated SARS-1 antibody in complex with SARS-2, just from the SARS-1. Yeah, so it's homology modeling. We didn't determine that, that second structure. In some cases we have at the, at the back end, but that's not part of the design process. So it's all done in silico. You and your animations. Um, so there's, there's been a couple of, of increasing successes so far. So we started actually with vaccine uh, protein redesign. So we were working in the um, meningitis B FHBP antigen. Um, the current structure of that is that there, there is a vaccine available. So it's sort of a test case, but you have to co-formulate multiple um, antigenic variants to get the, the full breadth of, of protection. And so there are little pilot case uh, back in like 2017 was to see if we could get that down to a single antigen that could protect against all of the, the subtypes. Um, there was some success there, but I think it was mostly a learning experience. Um, we pivoted quickly to SARS when that became highly relevant, as we all did. Um, and we started with uh, actually three antibodies uh, that, that bound, neutralized, and protected against SARS-1. Um, and we redesigned them to, to neutralize SARS-2, which was successful in all cases, even though it wasn't quite clinically relevant. Um, and fortuitously, some of the ones that, that we redesigned for SARS-2 still bound, neutralized, and protected SARS-1, sort of opening up the door to possibility of, of, of cross protective antibodies. Um, I wasn't involved in this one, Dan, I don't know if you wanna say anything about that, but I think it was just um, a computational design to try and address some of the variances they were coming up very early. So when uh, Delta hit, and then again, when Omicron hit, um, you know, keep redesigning a, a previously efficacious antibody to hit new targets to increase that breadth, not just to shift it along, but also to be able to protect against back variants, which might reemerge. Um, and one of our biggest successes um, was taking one of the components of Evishel, uh, which was highly protective. It was, it was the um, FDA authorized treatment for immunocompromised people. Um, and it completely lost efficacy once the Omicron variant came out. And so we had sort of a rapid sprint to redesign that um, to be able to restore potency against Omicron, but also back protect against the others. And that was, um, that was a wild success. It was, uh, potently neutralizing, very protective in animal models. Actually, maybe that's next. Um, and we were pursuing that in partnership with uh, AstraZeneca, I guess that's public since it's on there. 
Um, but you know, in the in the in the next several months, it moved on to a new variant. So a great proof of concept um, that I think we can expand to be even more more potent in the future. Um, so this is just showing some of the um, this is the in vivo potency. So showing that. Uh, so isotype control is in black, so that's an irrelevant antibody. The original parental antibody that we redesigned was called 2130. So you could see that that is um, protective uh, in, in Wuhan, but not against Omicron BA1 or BA5, um, which came long after the redesign campaign. Um, and then in yellow is the one that we redesigned computationally and evaluated um, in vitro. And that is, it maintains its, its potency against Wuhan. Um, it restores the lost potency in Omicron and actually worked very well against BA5, which came, what, 10 months after the redesign campaign, um, which shows that you know, even as we're redesigning things for greater breadth, um, they may not be knocked out with the next one. They may extend you know, the life of a, of a given product you know, a year into the future. Um, and then in collaboration with Jesse Bloom's lab, uh, we did deep mutational scanning uh, uh, analysis to see what the, the liabilities of this new antibody was. Um, one question we had is, okay, if we fix it against Omicron, have we now made it more liable to a different escape mutation? Um, but that's not what we see. So we've shifted the potency um, down and to the right, which means um, that it's basically maintaining that same, that same profile. Um, no new liabilities are, are popping up. So it's not as if our redesigned thing is now ultra vulnerable to some new escape mutation, which is, which is promising to help us extend the efficacy into the future as new variants emerge. Um, maybe I'll hand it over to, to Dan to start talking about the, the strategy of the program and the computation. Yeah, thanks. So, um, what's that? With no warning. No warning, that's right. Uh, yeah, so, so those successes were pretty exciting for us and, and our, our, we're, we're funded by DOD, originally DARPA and, and others now. Um, and so that kind of gave birth to this, which is now the guide program, which is, can we use that concept of taking an antibody from the closest thing out there that might bind this, this newly emerged threat um, and make it work for that threat and make it broadly protective or, or whatever the desired attributes are. Um, and so we've stood up this program to, to, to build that out much further. Um, and so there's these kind of four components. So on the left is an experimental R&D aspect. Um, the two major focuses there are standing up this high throughput lab to rapidly screen candidates and provide some feedback to the in silico optimization. The second major component is developing assays to generate large amounts of data uh, to help train AI models to do the prediction better and faster than we currently do. Um, the, the second R&D aspect is developing those computational models. So simulation-based, AI-based, hybrid, um, for predicting things like binding, uh, predicting developability properties of antibodies, um, and predicting safety. The second major component is sort of the operational aspect. So now DOD considers this capability as part of their bio threat preparedness plan. So when something emerges, and this has already happened twice this year to us, we get called on to actually do a redesign campaign and, and use our, our in silico approach and our, our rapid response wet lab capability to do this rapid response. Um, and the, the last part is sort of preemptively designing these antibodies um, and antigen vaccines. Um, ahead of time across a broad um, range of, of possible future threats. So we're starting with you know, various families of viruses in this case um, initially and developing antibodies that are broadly protective for, for the family as much as possible. Okay, so really brief in terms of how the, the in silico part of our program works. Um, We've traditionally have focused very heavily on simulation to predict binding. That's what most of our initial successes were based upon. Um, and so we have multiple approaches for performing simulations to predict binding between an antibody and an antigen. Um, some of them are extremely high fidelity, atomistic, um, you know, all atom microdynamic simulation models. Um, some of them are coarser, but they span uh, longer length and time scales. Um, some of them include um, a larger diversity of initial structural models to handle structural uncertainty and sort of the natural fluctuations of these complexes. Um, and then we also have ML-based models 
um, which, which we have some of, but we're building out much further. Um, historically, the ML models have driven what to perform via simulation because there's traditionally there's been very low amount of empirical wet lab data. And so we, we, we base our predictions on simulations, but we can't possibly run, as Kate said, 10 to the 40 simulations when we're doing given design campaign. And so we have an ML model that steers which simulations to conduct to do that in a much, much more efficient manner and converge to a solution faster. Um, and then we have hybrid approaches that use both and then a bioinformatics um, approaches as well. Um, and, and those are, those are aimed at solving all aspects of the problem that, that we're trying to tackle now. And, and uh, we're continuing to develop the binding prediction, but we've moved into, in the last few years, uh, predicting properties for developability, including stability, um, pH sensitivity, aggregation, et cetera, um, and even things like safety. Um, the, the next piece is the optimization piece. And so this has become more and more important for us as we're optimizing towards more and more targets simultaneously. Um, so we have a multi-objective optimization approach that sort of balances this trade-off between um, an uncertainty and exploring the full design space while also honing in on promising parts of the design space. Um, uh, one of the ones that wasn't on our previous slide in terms of previous successes is one that we've, we've in the middle of now. Um, we, we're taking another COVID antibody from one of our partners, a clinical antibody um, that again has lost potency towards one of the variants. Um, we started working on it before the variant emerged because it was a known liability for the antibody. So we were doing a preemptive design to sort of robustify, if you will, the antibody just in case. Turns out that this has emerged. Um, and so that was another success. What we did there was we had to, we were optimizing the antibody for you know, 20 different liabilities and maintaining um, efficacy against all the previous mutations across the variants, you know, the, you know, the mutations in gamma, delta, BA1, XBB, you know, all, all, all of those. And so it was a massive co-optimization across lots of targets using many different prediction types um, and including uh, stability and human likeness as properties. Um, so it was an enormous um, compute task with a highly complex objective function. And then we whittle that down to that trade space where we use a pre optimization approach to then whittle it down to a small number of candidates that we then test um, experimentally. Um, and in, the, in a few of the cases that Kate presented, um, it required an iteration from experiments. And some of them we did it in a, in a single shot or, or zero shot, if you will, where the, the in silico approach led to the candidate. Um, in this last case, I just mentioned that we were doing, now it was, it was, it was two iterations. So it was in silico, to wet lab, back to in silico, which got us our, our final antibody. Um, here's an example of how we use simulations. Um, I talked a lot about binding, but we do other things. This one is showing um, uh, stability. So we're using an, an all atom um, microdynamic simulation approach um, to model the impact of um, individual and multi mutations to the antibody and how it affects the stability as an antibody alone and, and in complex. And so what you're seeing on this figure is results from one of our design campaigns um, where, um, uh, you know, this was before we had um, the objective function to include stability, but we went back and simulated those to see, could we have predicted the stability? Um, so what you're showing is, it, um, what this figure shows is if you're on the, the diagonal from the top left to the bottom right, that would be a perfect prediction because we have the experimental measurement on the x-axis, the prediction on the y-axis. And what you're seeing is there's, there's a good correlation, but what's extra important is that we can actually just classify did something just cause the stability to drop significantly versus roughly stay the same. And for the most part, with kind of three exceptions that I were able to sort of classify that. So now that we have this module in our optimization and in our prediction framework, um, we've been developing much fewer unstable antibodies. Um, in this design campaign, you can see a whole bunch of them are unstable. Those are multiple, yeah. Uh, they range from one to eight in this particular design campaign, yeah. And our, our top binder had the six mutations. This is the same example that Kate showed in the beginning where we showed the structure with those six mutations that created those new interactions. Um, okay. Um, oh, another another cool example that I'll highlight, um, and I'll talk for an hour about this one, so 
Kate's got to stop me. Um, is um, we, we've trained, um, I mean, language models are huge now. We've all heard about them. Um, they've been around for, for some time, even before chat GPT um, blew everything up. Um, and so we, we took an existing protein language model and fine tuned it to antibodies. Um, there's tons of sequences available, as many of you know, for antibodies and for proteins. Um, and it turns out that um, this works remarkably well. These are sequence logos um, for, for the example that we just showed um, of the SARS-1 to SARS-2 binder, where the language model, um, it's trained on human sequences. It wasn't trained on this one. It's never seen this one, but it's able to remarkably, um, with, with remarkable accuracy, predict you know, if we if we hide one of the amino acids or several of the amino acids from the model, it can predict what should be there, which is not the right thing that we should j judge this on. But it's kind of the only real thing we could do at, at scale um, to say, um, you know, we know what the true sequence is. Can you recover it once it's hidden? What we want to use this for is is originally what we used it for was to make sure that our redesigns are still kind of human like. Um, last thing we want to do is come up with some mutations that might be really high affinity, um, but just do not look like human antibodies that could cause several problems um, for developability. Um, we we've however been using it in many other ways now, including by giving the um, the embedded representation of this language model into our optimization framework, it has accelerated our optimization significantly um, in terms of being able to get to our, our optimal designs much sooner in terms of cycles, in, in silico cycles, and getting to a final answer that's a, a better final answer. Um, and the, the next thing that we're using a language model now is to actually uh, train it to be a predictor of protein-protein binding. We don't have that, that model yet. Um, we're in the process of training this model with the antigen in context. This is all this is all agnostic to antigen that I've shown so far. Um, so th to me, this is one of the most promising areas um, in terms of going forward for us. Um, like I said, we've, we've been driving all of our predictions of binding with simulations. And I think the next generation of this, um, which you know, a year and a half ago, I thought you know, isn't, isn't possible, um, is to drive it with, with pure machine learning. Um, I think it's possible because of the, the, the high throughput assays that are now um, possible to generate large data sets and with, with approaches um, in language modeling that can, that can really uh, generalize to like sort of unseen proteins. All right, I'll hand it back to Kate uh, to talk about the biology. Oh, yes. Um, we have not used a language model for that. Um, we have another thrust, which I completely glossed over um, to help predict that. That's being led by Sandia National Laboratories. Um, and that model does not, it's not been stood up yet and we haven't integrated it into our, into our platform, but that, but that is the idea. That, that's a good question. We haven't done that yet. Do you have anything else to add to that? Or? No, that covers it. Yeah. I mean, because you're worried about anti-drug antibodies reducing the efficacy of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as we're redesigning the antibody, are we creating antigenic sequences that might be picked up through other immune mechanisms and yeah and, and yeah one of those is sort of anti-drug but you're right anti-t cell whatever mhc yeah i yeah i mean just, just i mean just just really, really briefly i don't want to dwell on too much but the there's lots of data associated with that that we could preemptively use or use in the loop to say i want to make sure I, we don't introduce those into the designs and it's 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 not a hard thing to do given those data points um what's tricky is do we believe that I mean, do we, do we believe that those are, um, should we avoid those? And I, I have not seen compelling data one way or the other on that. So we haven't leaned in hard with that yet. Yeah, we're also working more in infectious diseases. And so some of the administration strategies are, are, are single dose. 
or two doses. So it's not like sort of a therapeutic cancer vaccine where you're giving, you know, 15 doses, you know, four weeks apart and, and really are generating immune responses to that drug. So different contexts, but I, I think it is a, a critical component. Um, yeah. So Dan's talked a lot about sort of some of the computational pipelines and sort of the high gloss overview or also building up um, different strategies for high throughput production in vitro. Um, and so, you know, we are exploring different pipelines. Maybe I'll talk about them later, maybe I won't. But our, our main pipeline is, is trying to get at sort of the, the FDA approachable antibody. So we're, we're trying to format these things as full, full MABs, IgG1 format. Uh, we're producing them in CHO cell lines, just like they would be manufactured um, for the clinic, um, but trying to do that at, at as high a throughput as we can. Um, so we are, we are, you know, currently in the process of down scaling into plates and then upscaling into throughput. Um, we have some automated uh, screening instruments that allow us to skip some steps at the end. So we don't have to produce a ton of uh, material um, as you often do for antibody characterization. Um, we don't even have to purify it. The assays are, are ultra sensitive for the binding uh, quantitation um, just a couple days after transfection. So you're not waiting that two weeks. You're not you know, spending a couple days purifying, um, et cetera, before you have to go into your characterization assays. Um, and so this allows us to do more rapid loops and, and integrate more tightly with, with the comp. So we can do fairly short iterations. Um, you know, we don't have that slide anymore. So we can do fairly short iterations. So in the time it would normally take to computationally design and fully evaluate antibodies, we can now do two of those iterations in the same amount of time. So that's really sped up um, and it increases our hit rate too on successes. Um, we do scale up for some of the assays, some of the developability stuff um, just can't be done with, with low level or, or unpurified material, um, but we can down select ahead of that process, which is helpful. Um, we're also, you know, standing up high throughput uh, functionality assays, you know, neutralization, egress. We are often focusing on viruses, though maybe that won't be forever. Um, we're doing uh, kinetic affinities. Uh, we're doing structural characterization um, and other, other measures of biophysical characterization or developability. So that's all being done in high throughput currently at the scale of um, on the order of hundreds, but we're hoping to get up to being able to do a thousand at a batch. So maybe I'm promising the moon. Oh, sorry, that slide isn't there. Look at me. Uh, so this is this is just what I meant. So our, our old process, it took about four weeks to do the, the computation that includes simulation um, in silico iteration um, and then producing sort of a candidate list to be tested in vitro. Um, and then we're now going through our, you know, generate the antibodies um, clones, produce them as protein, purify them and evaluate them, which usually takes about eight to 10 weeks using sort of the traditional scale process. So it's, it's about three months to do the whole thing end to end. Um, but by shrinking that process, the in vitro evaluation process to four weeks, and that is with that full length IgG CHO produced antibody, um, getting high quality data in four weeks, we can turn that back around for another iteration. And in the same amount of time, get two iterations in that I mean, it increases our hit rate um, multiple fold so far. Yeah, so it, it's still a binding based assay. We're looking for affinity. Um, we can do affinity at equilibrium. We can do ELISA style assays, but it's, it's column based. Um, so there's no, there's no background noise. So you can, as long as you can quantitate the amount of IgG in your sample, you can do this, this column based ELISA style binding assay and get incredibly sensitive, accurate information that, that bridges perfectly with the purified material at the end. It's automated. It uses about four microliters of material. I mean, you get away with sort of 10, 10 nanograms per mil sort of um, production yields. So that allows us to sample very early and not have to purify because you, you lose stuff in purification. No. They're all secret. They're not secret. They're just not published yet. We have, I mean, we have, we have a manuscript in prep for some of the, um, the Omicron retargeting. But yeah, if anyone's interested in the actual details of that, I'm happy to share it. It's not, it's not actually a secret. That paper's on Biologic. Oh, that's right. I'm PubMed unique. So if you look up my last name, you'll find it. I don't think this, this is on there though, but yeah. Oh. Not the fast version. Really? Okay. There's a new publication we should build towards. Okay. So in addition to some of the more traditional, you know, IgG production, um, we're also leaning into yeast display and phage display to get 
more bang from the buck and actually generate the numbers um, that Dan's going to need to stand up some of the machine learning components. Do you want to talk more about this? This is oh, uh, yeah. Oh, where's Dante when we need him? I know. <laughs> um, yeah. So so this is a thrust that um, started less than a year ago now, where um, we have a couple of partners. Um, they're on here: Just Evotech, um, Los Alamos Lab, and Sandia Lab, where we're working to develop um, AI models to predict all sorts of properties for developability of the antibody. And so we're screening huge libraries and trying to capture all of the data as opposed to, to capturing some of the top hits against the target. We, so one example here is we would take a library, put it under heat stress or, or pH stress, um, and then use a capture agent to detect if it's if it's retained, um, if it's if it's misfolded, or if it's still um, if it's still a stable antibody, and then deep sequence capture all that data. Use that, train the machine learning model, take that data, propose another library, and generate that, and continue that cycle until the AI model can predict with high accuracy any arbitrary antibody if it's going to withstand these stresses or or just whatever properties we give it. We're doing the same thing for polyreactivity. So we're handling, uh, giving it a bunch of sort of human biomolecule targets and trying to predict what makes it sort of polyreactive. Um, separately, we do have a structural based sort of um, uh, approach to look at various sequence and structure properties of the antibody that correlate with developability. Um, some of the obvious ones being patches of hydrophobicity or, or charge or obviously you know, free cysteines, th th things like that. Um, and the last thing I mentioned, which is on the slide, is we want to do the same thing for binding, which is harder because for binding, it's you now have a combinatorial explosion. Instead of being an antibody only property, it's antibody in the context of its, its binding partner an antigen in this case. And so we're generating, um, we haven't started this yet, but we've, um, we're generating, uh, we're about to start generating data from you know, uh, phage and yeast libraries against a large number of targets, a diversity of targets. So we're gonna have a library of libraries on the on antibody side, against um, a large panel, but not, not library sized of antigen variants in, um, across multiple viral families um, with the hopes of taking that data and doing the same thing, training a model, um, but now for binding and then um, using that model to propose the next round library screen to try to increase the predictive power of the machine learning model. Um, so to me, that's very exciting because if that works, I think it will. That'll enable things like de novo antibody design. It'll enable extremely rapid redesign of antibodies for retargeting. Um, and if we couple it with, with this model that we're showing here, um, we'd co-optimize that for antibodies to be highly developable um, and safe. Um, one of the things that we're doing to support both the binding prediction model and this developability model is bringing the language models to the table. So I talked about that really briefly earlier. Um, we are, we're investing really big on that now. We're, we're, instead of having sort of these small scale language models that, that, that are out there for, for this work, um, we wanna to go to like GPT-3 sized models, like in massively large language models um, and have them be antibody specific, um, trained on billions of antibody sequences. Um, that language model, the hope is that the representation that it learns, um, the, embed the embeddings, are gonna be highly informative when we couple it with this kind of library data. I think bringing those two together, I think that's the future of this, of this, whole, of this whole endeavor. Um, so I think we're a couple of years away from that. Um, we're generating this data now, we're about to start generating the, the, the binding data. Um, and it's an area that we talked about at lunch today um, where I think there's many versions of how to generate this binding data. The one that we're doing now is sort of the what's feasible to do literally today with no new assay development. Um, but with a small amount of assay development, I think these, these high throughput display platforms can be repurposed to capture all of the data deep, with deep sequencing. Um, and it requires additional work to get there, but I, I don't think it's an insurmountable amount of work. So I'm super excited about that direction. I think it's, it's the future of this, this whole program. Um, Okay, I think the next slide might be, oh, okay. So I'll save your words about here. So um, I already kind of mentioned how we're, uh, this is kind of an old slide. On the left is, is we're continuing to work on COVID. Um, the thing that's written here, we've already done and it was a success. We've optimized it for 50 variants. Um, it, it worked. Um, and so that's, that's now in preclinical development. Um, the next thing that we would do um, outside of our biodefense threat um, um, uh, targets would be influenza. 
Um, we're already working with a partner there that has um, a highly um, a highly broadly neutralizing flu antibody, but it's just not sufficiently potent to be, you know, kind of viable as a clinical candidate. Um, they've had a phase one trial with it; it's protective, but but just you need too much. Um, yeah, um, too, yeah, material. yeah, you need too much material to inject for for it to be, you know, it's kind of practical. So the idea there is, can we increase that potency but maintaining the breadth all across? Um, that's kind of a moonshot type of thing, but we're, we're going to go for it because it would have a high impact. Um, and we're pretty excited about that. Um, most of our targets that we're working on right now are kind of DOD pathogen threat targets. We're working on alpha virus as our, as our year one kind of family. And so there's multiple viruses there where we're trying to preemptively develop um, broadly protective antibodies against, against the family there. Okay, that's okay. Uh, and maybe just a, a, a quick plug and we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, we've mostly talked about antibodies. That's what we've spent the bulk of our effort on. Um, we are sort of relaunching ourselves into the vaccine redesign market. Um, so we have a couple sort of very young strategies for, for how to start. Um, so we're, we're going to take proteins and, and using the same platform, re-engineer them for broad cross-protection um, and, um, you know, using a, a variety of techniques, including, you know, germline enrichment um, and others. Uh, we're also looking at um, robustifying, since now that's a word, uh, scaffold presentation to help with immunofocusing and stuff like that, and which is, can also lean heavily on some of the structural prediction tools that are already embedded in the platform. So trying to figure out how to leverage this, this cool um, set of tools in, in a bunch of different ways. So with that, maybe we'll, we'll close it up. Um, here are several subsets of the team, um, a mixture on the, on the left and, and more of a bio uh, biased picture that I slid in there on the right. Um, and it, it is a very large team spanning a, a lot of different disciplines and a lot of focus areas. And um, it's really been a lot of fun to try and get those different things to work together. Thank you. And thanks for interrupting. Any other, any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I would just throw words like Bayesian and, and recalibration. At you. Those are good words, yeah, Bayesian. Uh, great question. So I, I think of active learning as useful in two distinct regimes here. One is in um, in a design campaign. I think that was your question. So I have a specific target or set of targets. I have a starting point. I do some designs in silico and I wanna have the, the batch that I select for the wet lab to be maximally informative for my next round. Um, that's one. The, the other one is I don't have a target. I'm just trying to make a general predictor of binding or a general predictor of thermal stability. And for there, we're, we're basically trying to get the model to, to be as best as it can broadly throughout the whole space. And so for the, for the second one, we're very, very much driven by all of our models have an uncertainty estimate. So we're driven by the uncertainty estimate and say, where is it most uncertain? Um, and propose things there in those places. Um, in the design campaign, it's a little bit trickier because we're trying to balance a couple of things. One is we'd like to succeed in the first round. That's, that's the ideal. We've done that sometimes, not every time. And so it's not actually pure active learning in that case, right? We say we there's, you know, we're going to propose some that we think are, um, uh, we're going to enrich the set for things that we think are highly uh, successful. But we know that we're not always correct in our predictions. We're often quite wrong. And so we want to have that diversity. And so the active learning approach naturally helps with that. Um, and, but then the, the third component is we want to position ourselves to be good for iteration too. And so that's where we, um, where the diversity comes in informed by the uncertainty estimate. So we sort of have to do a game time decision of how much do we go in on the ones that we're confident in to try to succeed on the first round? And how much do we allocate towards, you know, oh, what if we fail? We wanna, we wanna improve the model as much as possible for round two. Um, and so we just, that's kind of a human decision. The rest of it is kind of geared by sort of a Bayesian approach where we look at the uncertainty and um, we, we try not to choose designs that are too similar to each other. Um, in fact, that's been 
something I try to communicate to various reviewers constantly where they say, well, your hit rate, you know, what's your hit rate? And I'm like, well, don't worry about the hit rate <laughs> because if I pick my top 10 designs, they might all be improvers, but we don't care about improvement. We want sufficient improvement to be clinically efficacious, sufficiently potent. Um, and so if all of those improve, but none of them are a home run, doesn't really help a patient, although it would help the hit rate of our algorithm. And so we, we typically try to go for that home run every time, which means we make sure we don't have sequences that are too similar to each other. We have a very, very diverse batch. Right, did that rambling answer help with your question? It's the most valuable thing, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Everyone loves that logo. It's an old slide. Yeah, it is that algorithm. So it's interesting because like that's what annoys me about the history of healthcare. Mm -hmm. And those are factors that are traditionally not helpful. Yep. So does that suggest that we could build a library that had nothing to do with all H1, H2, all humanized? Interesting question. I would say that would be very limiting. Um, in all of our successes, um, some of the most critical interactions were outside of H3 and L3. Yeah, and, and many people are doing just that. They are focusing on those because one, they are the most variable. They do tend to change the most, at least in viral diseases. It does change based on the pathogen, like what the preferences are. Um, it's also easier because you can make a, a single, you can order a single E block that will cover just those two and not have to worry about the others, which is most of the reason that people limit their design spaces to make it um, practical. But yeah, we've, we've had several that if you didn't have like the L1, like you'd have been sunk, you wouldn't have been able to start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it depends on what you're trying to do. So I think, I think you're right. Like we, we haven't, fully ex exploited that aspect where you could cut out your entire, like a huge portion of your search space, of your design space by limiting that. And that could work, but the caveat to that is um, two. One is if you're, if you're starting with a library and you say, let's just diversify H3 and, you know, maybe, some, but, but keep, keep most of the, you know, L1, L2 sort of fixed, you'll still find binders. What we're trying to do oftentimes is we've got a clinically important antibody and we want to make it work for a neighbor. And so that's a specific thing we're trying to do. And it may require, and, it, and every time for us, it has required changes in the other chains. Um, if we had started from scratch and try to find a brand new antibody to bind a whole different site, maybe we could keep those other chains fixed. But to, 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 to fix an existing antibody would require. Second point is um, Kate, Kate showed the slide where, you know, we restored potency for the antibody against BA1 and BA11, and it maintained that potency all the way through BA5, even when the parental lost a lot to those. And that's partly because um, our discussion about hotspots, right? Antibodies have hotspots. We try to establish diverse contacts throughout. So if one contact is lost, it's still a potent antibody because we have spatially distant interactions that we've introduced, which oftentimes may require the other chains. Well, that was the interruption that I was gonna make. One of our biggest success stories was essentially the main contacts were somewhat in the middle of the epitope. And we didn't do this intentionally, but through the act of learning, not in the I was trying to point at the screen and I'm not in the mic. Um, the, the, the native critical contacts were sort of in the center of the epitope and just naturally emerging from the machine learning in silico prediction, it was picking residues sort of on the periphery of the epitope and it robustified, robustified, now I'm using it all the time. It increased the affinity, increased the contacts along that border. And that really helped it um, not just gain affinity, but, but it was more robust against more variants because any one of those could be lost and it would still maintain affinity because it had the five out of six. Yeah, and if I, if I can add, and, and that, that's one of the, the huge, I mean, if, if there's one of the few things that we, are, we contribute with what we're doing, it's that. It's that we can deliberately target new interactions in other places um, as opposed to, um, you know, screening and seeing, seeing what we get. So, so we can say we want this to work well against 
all of these existing variants and potential variants. And the things that will work against all of those would, would be these kind of conserved things or things where we've built in redundancy in, in disparate locations along the interface. And, and oftentimes they're, they're novel contacts, not, not pre-existing contacts for that epitope. Yes. Yeah, great, great question. So um, we, uh, I wouldn't say we've cracked the code. That's why I want to get the AI model doing it because the, the every tool out there is uh, uh, is broken in a different way. Yeah, that's a good way of saying it. So, so, so the, the different tools, and, and we've built our own, and they're good enough to use and be informative and work sometimes, but they're also bad enough that like they oftentimes don't predict correctly. Um, so what we do is we do this Pareto optimization approach, which what that means is we've got multiple predictors of binding. We've got predictors of stability. We've got human life, we have other things. And we're only going to test say hundred or 200. And so um, in addition to diversity, we enforce that the ones that we pick to test in the wet lab are on this Pareto front. So on the Pareto front means you, you can't find a better antibody for, um, for these properties unless you sacrifice some other property. So all the ones in the predator front are called non-dominated, meaning, meaning it scores well across every property um, and there's no other antibody that is better on all properties. Right? And so that whittles it down substantially because that, that's sort of this you know, slice on the entire set of possibilities that's like on that like border. Um, that's a much, much smaller set to test. And we, we even have to sample from those. Do we increase the index? The Pareto. Um, Yeah, we still use a similar Pareto approach and we, um, uh, so there's two things we get from the wet lab data to do in form iteration two. One is well, what are the top hits? And for we can sort of expand around those. And so now we have high confidence that, well, we at least know these are binders or stronger binders. And, and now we add predictions to a neighborhood around them. And then the other thing is that it trains the model to just be more accurate so we can propose things even farther away. Um, and so when we look at that down selection for the round two, we have the same criteria. It's still stability binding and based on all of our predictions, but now we also have an empirical prediction that's driven by the first round data. And so our iteration twos often look quite different from the iteration one, just because of that. Yeah. Great question. In fact, let's see. I think what you're asking is 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 kind of the story I like to tell with this one. Is this part here? It, it, it's not great at saying is this really a, a minus four DDG or five DDG? Meaning, like, is it like great or really great? It's not good at telling that apart, but it's very good at saying. This is an improvement better than like, you know, negative two DDG, or this is a catastrophic mutation that, that makes the binding energy super high. That's what we want. That's what we want. So when we couple that with diversity, that's where we can get successes, right? Because we'd say, you know, we, we, we don't pick, we don't pick just, just those top ones be, for two reasons. One, because of what you said, we, we know that there's an error there. And so, um, you know, we don't just pick our, our like, you know, our, our, our top 10 or in this case, our bottom 10. Um, we, we, we know that like, it's just good at knowing this is in the highly improved category. And within that, we can't tell them apart. And, but secondly, is diversity. Even if, we, even, if, even if we believed it, we'd still say, well, these are all kind of very similar. 
That's why they're all here because the predictions all converged because they're all very similar antibodies. So we're going to pick one of those and then go move on to another one. Yeah. Yes. That's what we're doing. I think there's no other way to do it. So we're going to train the LLM on just sequence data, billions of, of sequences. And then we're going to add the antigen for ones where we know the structure. And there's like in PDB there for antibody antigen, there's like 8,000 or so for protein, protein, there's 50, 60,000 where the structure is known. So we're going to, um, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to do an antigen anti or actually a protein, protein language model where we're not pruning, but we are guiding. Um, yeah, we're essentially guiding the attention map of the language model based on the known um, amino acid contacts at the interface. The hope is that we train it with that, then it'll um, it'll gracefully degrade when we have less and less co-structure information. So even if we have none, all we know maybe is it binds this, this side of the protein, or maybe even not at all, but it would still perform reasonably well. It'll perform better if we have the structure, but it'll it'll but with simulation we can't do anything with that structure. With this model, we we could, although it would degrade a little bit performance. Yeah. Oh, to change the epitope, so if. So you're talking about not, um, how do you make sure when we did the SARS-1 to SARS-2 redesign and we were targeting a specific epitope that was homologous on both molecules, how do we know we didn't shift it around on the epitope? I, competition, binning, um, experimentally. I, we, ha we haven't really seen it. I mean, I think it's really unlikely for it to like pick up and move all the way to a different spot because like it's really hard for us to even design that intentionally. Um, what we do, what I suspect anecdotally might be happening sometimes is like a shift of the angle of attack, or maybe it's it's creeping a little bit one way as we're strengthening new contacts on the side that it didn't have before. But it's not it's not huge. I'm, so I it's no movement that we can detect by competition binning. Um, we do structures, but not not hundreds a day. <laughs> Yeah, and, and we're we're modeling it. So when when we're modeling the, this this different target with a few mutations on it, we model the structure. Could be wrong, but we we've modeled that and we we account for that in the predictions and simulations. Did you have a question before? Well, that, that's the that, that's the big question. So what, what when I was talking about generating data with the library display platforms, that's aimed at that question, which is can we can we generate enough diversity on an angenic space and antibody space that a trained model would be generalizable and apply to a whole new system, a whole new antigen? That, that it's not um, today the AI models. I've never seen one that can do that. There isn't one like that. That's where we use simulation because simulation is physics-based and it'll generalize to a new system just because physics, you know, generalizes. Yeah. And so our, our ML models that have driven most of our previous successes have been ML based on simulation data for that system. So we have, it's not as good as empirical data, but AI models will just catastrophically fail if you trained it on SARS and then want to use it on, on flu. Um, and so that, that's why we want to train it on a diversity of things. Otherwise, it won't work. Yeah. Yeah, that part. So we haven't done that part yet. Our, 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 what we're about to launch is that. It's, it's a library of libraries on the fab side. Um, and then uh, we're going to start with like 10 viral families for each viral family, three to five antigenic variants and screen the library of libraries 
for the three against the three to five variants, and then do another screen against the next family and the next family, and do that for ten, and then just see how well that works. <laughs> yeah. Really great questions. Thanks. Thanks for all the questions. Okay. Six to six. Eight. Yeah. Is it If you're talking about like polycyclic uh, or generally antibiotics, yeah, because when they're the antibiotics, they like. Just like, yeah. 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 yeah, so they definitely go through real. Um, so we're, we're trying to do that twofold, and part of that's going to be part of that's going to be some of the intelligence. So usually, experimentally, it's done by you make a thing with one of one panels are pretty long. You're looking for basically the people that are going to be that. Yeah, that, that's that's the feature. Which yeah, I mean, know that they don't know. Currently, yeah. where we guard ourselves against that is we don't we don't um we don't try to move forward like these similar antibodies because if they if, if if one of them is probably reactive, maybe all of these in the backyard. So we make sure that the ones that we move forward are diverse so that like. It'd be less likely that they all Anyone are. Like probably, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is possible. We have to inspire like a. So we'll still yeah. have to go through the right. tissue trust right here. But you would, you would only test that in vitro. Just the machine learning yeah. model. Or we test yeah. it by seeing. We don't yeah. have the model yet to predict that. That's what we're trying to do. So currently, it'd be in vitro. Oh yeah, yeah, we have yeah. yeah. So we are yeah. starting yeah. to control our problems. These are like normal ones. Like well, I don't think they've been around here. Because what's the other one? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.